Hello and welcome back as we continue our read through Philip Yancey's book, The Bible Jesus Read. And uh, we hope you that you're enjoying it. We're in the chapter called Job Seeing in the Dark. The book hinges on the issue of integrity. Job acts as if God's integrity is on trial. How can a loving God treat him so unjustly? All of Job's legal briefs, however, surface within the setting of the larger trial set up in chapters 1 and 2. The test of Job's faith. God seeks, as a line from Handel tells it, love unsought by price or fear. From our omniscient reader's viewpoint, we watch for cracks in Job's own integrity as he loses one by one everything he values. The story of Job strikes a sympathetic chord with us moderns because we too have put God on trial over the issue of suffering. Eloquently, powerfully, we demand answers from God and, the, and God's treatment of Job is one of those issues we shake our heads over. We retell Job's story, quote him, take comfort in his words of protest. Job gives voice to some of our most deeply felt complaints. We cry into the night and there is no reply, reply said Bertrand Russell. That we find such sympathy for Job's predicament reveals much about our modern attitude toward God. Significantly, all the modern retellings of the ancient story cast Job as a tragically heroic figure. figure. Ellie Weissel goes so far as to scold Job for giving in to God. After surviving the Holocaust, Weissel had no sympathy for a character who would surrender to God so abjectly. He preferred to believe that the true ending of the book was lost and that Job died without having, without having humiliated himself that he succumbed to his grief, an uncompromising and whole man. C.S. Lewis put his finger on the reason behind our emphatic, sorry, excuse me, empathetic response in his essay, God on the Dock. The ancient man approached God, or even the gods, as the accused person approaches his judge. For the modern man, the roles are reversed. He is the judge. God is on the dock. He is quite a kindly judge. If God should have a reasonable defense for being the God who prevents war, poverty, and disease, he is ready to listen to it. The trial may even end in God's acquittal. But the important thing is that man is on the bench and God is on the dock. Although Job may help us form our questions about unjust suffering, it fails to give many answers for a very simple reason. Chapters 1 and 2 have clearly shown that regardless of what Job thinks, God is not on trial in this book. Job is on trial. The book does not provide answers to the problem of pain. Where is God when it hurts? For the prologue has already dispensed with that issue. The point is faith. Where is Job? How is he responding? The more I studied Job, the more I realized I had always read the book from the perspective of chapter 3 on. I needed to go back and reconsider the message of Job from the very first chapter. There I located the core plot. The best man on earth suffers the worst calamities, which poses a test of faith in its most extreme form. Oops, sorry about that. And that, man, I am just falling apart during this recording. I'm sorry, people. Um, are human beings truly free? Satan challenged God on that count. We have freedom to descend, of course. Satan himself, Adam, and everyone who had ever lived has proven that. But do we have the freedom and ability to ascend, to believe God, for no other reason than, well, for no reason at all? Can a person believe even when God appears to him as an enemy? Or is faith like everything else, a product of environment and circumstances? The modern behaviorist Edward O. Olson explains Mother Teresa's good deeds by pointing out she was secure in the service of Christ and in her belief in immortality. 
In other words, believing she would get a reward, she acted on that selfish bias. There is no pure altruism, says Wilson and other evolutionary psychologists. We have faith in God in hopes that we will get something out of it. In the opening chapters of Job, Satan reveals himself as the first great behaviorist. Job is conditioned to love God, he claims. Take away the positive rewards and watch faith crumble. Job, oblivious and effectively blindfolded, ranks as the main protagonist in a single warrior combat test of the ages. Job's friends. Satan does not make an appearance after chapter 2 of Job, nor does he need to, since Job's friends ably represent his point of view. In a splendid stroke of dramatic irony, most of the book's high-sounding but false theology comes from the mouths of the pious, devout men who at the end get leveled by a withering blast from God. Job's three friends, and to a lesser extent Elihu, Follow the behaviorist party line. Common sense and all reason tells us, they argue, that a just God will treat people fairly. Those who obey and remain faithful, God rewards. Those who sin, God punishes. Who could refute that? They then take the next logical step of concluding that Job's extreme suffering must betray some serious, unconfessed sin. If Job only stopped being so stubborn and represented, or and repented, God would surely pardon and restore him. Job's friends get bad press, and rightly so, since God summarily dismisses them in the end. Nonetheless, they are not men of straw. They argue forceful, forcefully, and their calm reasoning contrasts with Job's uncontrolled outbursts. It would suggest that if today we had only Job 3 through 37, we would judge the three friends as the true heroes of the book. Why do I say that? Simply because their arguments are still being sounded in Christian churches. To truly grasp the uh, presence and timelessness of this book, Consider the argument of Bildad, Elphaz, and Zophar in the light of contemporary thinking. Does God send suffering as punishment for sins? Ask any hospitalized Christian whether he or she has heard that suggestion. The most vigorous assertion of Job's friends that God makes good men prosper and evil men stumble. Uh, I hear virtually every time I watch a religious program. Those programs say little about Job's kind of faith, which perseveres even when nothing works out the way it should. Christians today may also claim a word of knowledge to back up their beliefs, as did Eliphaz's own line of argument, and even implies that Job should turn to God for a miracle. In short, Job's friends emerge as self-righteous dogmatists who defend the mysterious ways of God confident of their proper doctrine and sound arguments. They cast judgment on Job. To them, the issue seems clear-cut. Given a chance between a man who claims to be just and a God they know to be just, what possible defense could Job have? George MacDonald compares their attitude to that of the Pharisees, who care more about paying court to God and allowing and following the rules than coming into God's presence as children. Job, like any wounded child, insisted on his right to demand some explanation. True to their piety, Job's friends are scandalized by his outbursts. The very idea of questioning God, even demanding an audience with the Almighty, a modern-day bumper sticker, succinctly captures their condescending tone. If you feel far from God... Guess who moved? And that's where we're going to end today. Hopefully we'll see you next week.